Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for joining this afternoon. My name's Charles Perrone. I'm uh, general manager of Visa Global Solutions Transportation Compliance based out of Stowe, Ohio. Um, if you're not familiar, Stowe, Ohio is a suburb of Akron, Ohio. Uh, Akron, Ohio is about 30 minutes south of Cleveland. So uh, unfortunately, yes, I'm a Browns fan. We fall within that radius of Browns fans. But um, I hold a, um, a bachelor's of accounting from the University of Akron and also an MBA with a concentration in finance from Ashland University. Uh, I've been with Visa since 2013. Prior to that, I was with a firm called OTS, Operating Tax Systems, which was purchased by Visa in 2013. The topics for today we're going to be covering are fuel tax compliance, licensing, permitting, and registration, and hours of service compliance. Just by a show of hands, uh, how many of you are familiar with these items? You have you work for organizations right now that that um, that employ these types of uh, compliance items. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. So I'd like to start off with understanding fuel tax. Okay, uh, a fuel tax is a state or provincial a uh, tax levied on the sale of fuel at the pump. It's an excise tax, it's a use tax. It's levied on all consumers. So passenger vehicles like you and I drive, it's levied on us. It's also levied on commercial vehicles as well. Uh, it's levied on all fuel types, such as gasoline, propane, kerosene, and diesel. Uh, there's juris jurisdictional oversight on uh, the fuel tax, well, meaning the jurisdictions, whether they be provincial in Canada or the states here in the US, they have the latitude to make changes to the fuel tax rates whenever they so choose. And uh, fuel tax is general revenue or usually earmarked for transportation projects such as uh, maintenance, maintenance of our roads, um, maintaining our roads, and uh, uh, infrastructure improvements. So we have, we basically come at a crossword here. We have personal use versus commercial use. And as I mentioned, before, you know, like you and I, we pay fuel tax to the pump, but when we pay for it, we don't do anything else. We pay for it, we buy it, we use it, we consume it, we can consume it across multiple states or provinces, and that's it. We don't have to think about it ever again. But for commercial use vehicles they're involved in, that are involved in interstate commerce and have a gross vehicle weight of greater than 26,001 pounds, gross vehicles, they're treated a little differently. Uh, why? Because commercial motor vehicles do the most damage to our roads. Um, once you get into that type of weight, they're putting a lot of damage to our roads. And also, because of that, they're required to distribute the, an apportioned tax to member jurisdictions based on where the fuel is burned. So all the jurisdictions, including Canada, provinces up there, say we want our fair share so we can fix our roads, so we can maintain our roads, we can improve our roads. So this creates some challenges for commercial carriers. Fuel burned here, tax paid there, it's a little bit confusing. Currently, you need to reconcile with each state separately. That's a lot of different reconciliations you have to do, especially when you have to do it for each state with their, their own form. There's record keeping and auditing requirements because now you're required to do these reconciliations with the states or provinces. Those are auditable instruments at this point. Um, now we have a need for an efficient method of jurisdictional apportionment and distribution of that use tax Commercial carriers got to figure out how can we optimize this process? How can we do this and make this much more simple so we're not spending too much time doing it? How to minimize tax exposure from an audit? I just mentioned that these are auditable instruments now and they could be audited. How do you minimize your tax exposure? How do you prevent <coughs> additional tax from being incurred? And then you have cash flow and pump purchase strategies. You can either save now or save later. You could buy, you can make purchases in higher tax rate states. Uh, or you can, you can buy them in lower tax rate states where you'll pay a little bit more later. So we want to talk about the International Fuel Tax Agreement, IFTA. It was created in 1983 to simplify the fuel use tax reporting system, the apportionment and distribution process for carriers. It's a state provincial tax on qualified motor vehicles that travel in two or more jurisdictions in interstate commerce and one of the two following conditions. You have two or more axles plus a gross vehicle weight exceeding 26,001 pounds, or you have three or more axles regardless of weight. Tax returns are filed quarterly on a quarterly basis. And right now, we're actually in a quarter right now. Everybody who's familiar should be working on their uh, 
third quarter taxes right now. Uh, if the app operates as a clearinghouse, so you have a you have a base jurisdiction where you file one return in for all the states you've traveled in, all the jurisdictions, and they operate as a clearinghouse, so then they distribute your payments to all the other states, and now you're just working with one state, your base jurisdiction. And IFTA simplifies the process by helping you determine where you burn the fuel to be apportioned taxes in a simplified process. Preparation and filing, some of you are probably very, uh, very familiar with it. For all qualified motor vehicles with a, with, uh, within a given reporting period in accordance with their base jurisdiction guidelines, carriers are required to interpret and record total distance traveled by truck jurisdiction, and you either do that with trip sheets or uh, GPS and ELDs. You can do that with that, that type of information. You record total fuel purchased by truck by jurisdiction. You do that with paper fuel slips, fuel card purchase, download, or bulk fuel receipts, bulk fuel ledgers. It's a very good idea to audit and review those records for compliance. You summarize all distance and fuel records by jurisdiction. You populate your IFTA return. Most states you can file online now, states and provinces. You apply your quarterly tax rate. Make sure you're grabbing the, mo the latest tax rates. They're always, they're always updated every quarter. And then you file your return. And then lastly, retain all records and reports for seven years. IFTA is typically four years, IRP six, and then you have IRS seven. So it's recommended you keep everything for seven. So now I'd like to take a little bit of a deeper dive into what this whole, this calculation looks like, to give you an idea. Here's a scenario. We have a carrier that operates interstate travel in Florida and Georgia with a gross vehicle weight of greater than 26,001 pounds for their, their fleet. The carrier base state is Florida, so they're just gonna file one tax return in Florida. They buy, they buy all their fuel in Florida in the highest tax rate state. The Georgia fuel tax rate is 0 .3080. They traveled 4,000 miles in Georgia. They purchased no fuel in Georgia. They purchased all their fuel in Florida. The Florida fuel tax rate is 0 .3497. They traveled 6,000 miles in Florida and they, pur and they purchased 2,000 gallons of fuel at the pump, diesel. This is what the, the matrix looks like. Very simplified calculation, but we're just looking at two states, but the premise is the same for all jurisdictions. Imagine this, this form for 48 jurisdictions. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty pretty big form. You have your total miles traveled and you have your taxable miles. You'll, you'll notice there's two columns there, they're identical. In this case, they're identical, there's no, there's no issues. Sometimes you do, have, you do have instances where the taxable miles are reduced by a certain amount based upon conditions within the environment, for instance. If, they, if this company was involved in a rescue operation, miles, may, miles for that a certain period of time may be deemed non-taxable for IFTA, so you may have a, a deviation be between total miles and taxable. And you also have your, your tax paid gallons, oh, oops, your tax paid gallons over here in this column. This is what you purchased at the pump. In order to start this calculation, you have to start off with your MPG. You have to find out what your fuel efficiency rating is. In this case, it's 10,000 total miles divided by 2,000 gallons of tax paid fuel gives you an MPG of five, five miles per gallon in this case. This MPG, this, is your, this serves as your denominator in determining your taxable gallons right here. This is the fuel that you actually burn in each state based upon this calculation, okay? And remember, we talked about this at the beginning. This is an apportionment and redistribution tax. So in this, in this example here, you can see Florida, you're getting a credit. Florida got all of their tax at the pump already. They're not concerned about this anymore. However, Georgia, you see they have a net taxable gallon, 800. You multiply that by that same pump rate, that tax rate, to get your net due there. At the end of the day, they get a credit back $33.36. Again, they purchased a majority of their fuel. They purchased all their fuel in the high tax rate state. They paid it at the pump, and they got a little bit more back at the end of the quarter. They don't have an, any, they don't have an additional expenditure here. Cash flow considerations. I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well. You can, you know, some carriers, they don't have the choice. They have to buy fuel wherever they are. 
Other carriers, they employ strategies where they're able to, um, like in this, in this example here, they're purchasing all their fuel in lower tax rate states. But it, as you can see what happens at the end of the quarter when they file their IFTA return, when they do that dis redistribution process, they owe a considerable amount of money. Regardless, no matter what, they're still paying $74,622.40. It just depends, it's what this is just demonstrating is they're paying a little bit here at the pump, about half at the pump, and then they're settling up with the other jurisdictions at the end of the quarter. And this strategy over here, they decide, in this example, they're purchasing all of their fuel in PA, the highest tax rate state in this scenario, 0 0.7410. They pay all, primarily all of their, their fuel tax at the pump, and they get a little bit of a credit back here at the, uh, for the quarter. Again, they're still paying $74,622.40. You can't escape the tax, okay, unfortunately. So what is noncompliance? What does noncompliance look like? We've just uh, demonstrated what the IFTA return looks like, how you, how you uh, get to that end result. So under audit, as we generally talked about earlier, you can, these instruments are auditable. These tax returns that we're dealing with, they are auditable, and your state jurisdiction is responsible for auditing you. When under audit, a carrier may be found to be noncompliant if the carrier is unable to produce any source documentation. Auditor comes in and says, how did you get to this result? And they're able to produce nothing. Carriers are unable to produce odometer readings. They produce, they're able to produce some information, but they say, I need to reconcile what you've given me here with your odometer readings to make sure they're accurate. All I see here are summaries. The distance accounting system is found to be inadequate or produces output and consistent error. GPS vendor printouts, which we're going to touch base on here um, pretty soon, uh, we're going to talk about those printouts and what we should be aware of about when we're uh, downloading those summaries from our GPS vendor. Auditor defines that source documentation is illegible, not able to interpret. So you have trip sheets. Those trip sheets made it onto an Excel spreadsheet. You add everything up, you put it on your IFTA return. Auditor looks at those trip sheets and says, I, I'm, I'm not able to interpret what, how you got to this end result. These are illegible. Auditor finds missing distance or fuel transactions which didn't make it to the IFTA return. As a requirement, you're, re you're required to report 100% of the distance you traveled and 100% of the fuel that you purchased at the pump. The auditor finds gaps there, they will ID those gaps. Auditor finds material under, material under or over recorded mileage. They'll, they'll, they'll come up with an air factor and they'll project that across the entire fleet. Or returns are not prepared in accordance with jurisdictional guidelines. If we're looking here at the, oh, <coughs> this went the wrong button. If we, there we go. If we take a look here at IFTA audit statistics, I was able to obtain these from the IFTA website. Uh, IFTA website, pr they, they provide guidelines for all the member jurisdictions to which they should uh, adhere to, to, to follow. Uh, but as you can see, we're running a rate of percentage of, of carriers assessed in the 80s, pretty much 80%. When they, when they audit their, uh, their base, base jurisdictions, out of total, um, total audited, they're assessing around 80% of them. That's a pretty high percentage. I was not able to obtain the actual, what that really means in terms of dollars and cents, but regardless, that's still, a, to me, that's a shockingly high number that there's that many assessments happening out there. That means they're going to the carrier and saying, we found gaps, we found noncompliance, here's a bill, here's penalty and interest, and this is what you owe to remain in business, operating. So here's what a non-compliant audit assessment could look like, all right? Now this is could look like. I've seen this many times. Um, auditor, here's a scenario. The auditor is unable to substantiate reported miles and fuel due to poor record keeping practices from the carrier. Auditor cites carrier for non-compliance. This is the result. Inadequate record keeping defaults all if the returns under audit, typically 16 quarters, to a 4.0 MPG recalculates tax for all 16 periods. This is how it all unfolds. If we look at our example up here, this is, this is uh, captured from the example we used a couple slides back, if you remember this number here, okay? This is what they originally filed for 1Q 2019, so we're just looking at one return here, not all 16. The original MPG that this is calculated on was a 5.86. What the auditor will do 
in order to make the math work, they have to be able to prove, or they, they need to be able to demonstrate a 4.0 MPG with math. They just can't make it a 4.0 without demonstrating how they got there. They impute fictitious fuel here. This fuel is not purchased at the pump. Nobody purchased this fuel, but this makes the math work in order to get to a 4.0 MPG. When you go to a 4.0 MPG, your denominator for your, your, your calculation for net taxable gallons decreases, which increases your net taxable gallons. So where they had net taxable gallons up here of, let's see, net taxable gallons here now with the 4.0 is 1,995 in Ohio, 40,433 compared to what we have up here. It's pretty staggering. You had a total of 73 net taxable gallons originally filed on a 4.0 net taxable is in that taxable gallons becomes 54,102. When you carry this calculation across, you come up with an additional tax of $34,699.42. If operations for that period for for this period are representative of operations for the entire all periods under audit, let's just say they operate around 700k miles per per quarter. They're purchasing around uh, 116,000 gallons of fuel per quarter, 120, give or take. They're hovering around this. This is consistent. You can expect that they will be assessed 34K per quarter. And if you extrapolate that out, you're looking at half a million in, in assessment. And that's just additional tax. We haven't even begin to, begun to talk about penalty and interest. And all the, diff all the states have different rates for penalty and interest. Okay? So... What do we do? You know, how do we, how do we, as a, as a, you know, how do we, what do we do to minimize our, our audit exposure? What do we do to make sure we're compliant? So when the audit comes, we're not afraid of the audit. We welcome the audit. So the auditor's goal is to determine accuracy of jurisdictional distance and tax paid fuel. That's all their goal is. That, that's that's their goal. The carrier's goal should be do what do what the auditor's going to do, anticipate what they're going to do, and do it before they do it. Mimic what the auditor's going to do. So for distance, using GPS, the auditor will require and route GPS positions to determine the representative representativeness of reported distance. If we, op if we unpackage that a little bit, if you're using a GPS printout and you give that to the auditor, and the auditor says, this is great, I like it. Where did you get it from? How did you get to this end, this end result? And you let them know that you went to your GPS vendor and said, oh, I, just, I just downloaded it. I said, great, that's wonderful. Okay, I need to know how they got to this end result. Now you got to go to your GPS vendor and start asking questions about how they got to that end result. The auditor will request for GPS positions, the breadcrumb trail, the Latin long readings with date and time stamps per truck, and recreate what you reported on your IFTA return. That's what they will do. And if it doesn't come out, it doesn't tie out to what you reported, you're going to have a problem. The auditor will examine trip records to ensure data entry accuracy. So if you're using trip sheets, they will do the same thing. They will audit all of those records, make sure that there's no continuity gaps, make sure that there are no uh, gaps in continuity between states and odometer readings. Auditor will attempt to ID and fill continuity gaps, and they will apportion any odometer variance per jurisdictional requirements. So if you have a sample truck, just as an example, let's say you have a truck that's part of the sample size, the sample selection and uh, for the quarter they reported 15,000 miles and the the auditor is able to obtain odometer readings and those odometer readings say that truck went 16,000 miles you have a variance of, of 1,000 miles under reported the carrier didn't do anything with that 1,000 miles the auditor will and then if they can demonstrate that that is representative of the fleet operations across all trucks all sample trucks they will extrapolate and then they will uh, apply an air factor to the entire fleet. For fuel, capture and record 100% of your tax paid fuel. That includes bulk fuel as well. Exclude non-applicable fuel, reefer fuel, DEF, that's the diesel particulate. Uh, you want to make sure those purchases are not included, don't make it to your IFTA return. And you want to match 100% of your fuel to the truck that it went into. This, is, this, is a, uh, it, this isn't a requirement for IFTA. And it also, when an auditor comes and you present them everything on a silver platter, it makes them feel very good about your record keeping requirements. If you hand them a bunch of fuel and you don't know where the fuel, what trucks it belongs to, it's going to make it very difficult for the auditor to do anything with that. 
you're going to still have to attempt to reconcile that to the truck that it went into. And if you're not able to do that, then you and the auditor will be having a very in-depth conversation about that. So protect yourself. Keep the audit in mind. Find an expert. Staff in-house. Outsource to a TPA or become one. Apply compliant record keeping. Know IFTA and IRP and your, ba your base jurisdiction. Approve source document, record type, and minimum record keeping requirements. Routes of travel and state line crossings need to be able to provide those upon audit. Trip sheets and GPS record keeping requirements, know what they are in your jurisdiction. Tax paid fuel receipts, make sure that you, you aggregate those, you store them, and you, you record them properly. You want to apply recommended data processing and audit practice. Accurate trip sheet entry is coming in from a driver who filled it out on the road. You have to somehow get that into some type of distance accounting system so you can make it so it can make its way to uh, aggregating all the miles per jurisdiction and then getting it on your IFTA return. Route GPS, just like the auditor will do, they're gonna audit, they're gonna route the GPS. It's recommended you also do the same thing. So when they do it, they come to we all come to the same result. We just replicate them. Be cautious of GPS vendor summaries as well. Identify and fix all continuity gaps to ensure 100% of 100% continuity. You have to account for GPS disruptions. They happen. Trip sheet gaps. Those happen. Match all fuel purchases to the truck. Record 100% of your tax paid fuel. Reconcile bulk fuel withdrawals and deposits. That's a big one as well. A lot of, there's a lot of misses on that one. And also, I don't have it on the slide, but please keep in mind, personal conveyance is also um, taxable. So if you have a driver that goes back and forth to go home, those miles, those, that distance that they, they consume and the fuel that they consume on the road, that's taxable, taxable activity. Reso and also retain all source data for seven years, if the IRP and IRS. Take a little bit of a deep dive into GPS record keeping requirements. I can't stress how important it is to make sure that you are able to supply what you need to supply to an auditor when they come to you. All, re all GPS records have to have a truck number, the lat reading, the long reading, longitude reading, a date and time stamp, an odometer reading, transponder number, which is your serial number for a device. You need to be able to provide distance summaries by truck by jurisdiction and retain that raw data for seven years. If you can't do these things, or if you have questions about these things, if you're using a, a GPS or an ELD vendor printout, it's highly recommended that you reach out to them and talk to them about it and ask them, what, what, do I, what is my risk here? Do you, are you able to supply these things for me if I need them? And how long will it take you to get those things to me? So here's the question. Can you support an audit with GPS vendor summaries? How is continuity filled? These are some questions you might want to ask your GPS vendor. How is continuity filled? When a device goes down, who has visibility to that? What's happening? How can I audit these jurisdictional summaries for continuity? Remember, in most cases, you're just downloading a report. It's total miles per jurisdiction, and that's it. There's very little visibility. Are GPS positions with truck number, date, time stamp, and odometer readings available? And how can I obtain them? Is there any additional cost to store or obtain this historical data? Do you retain historical data? What do you retain? And for how long? And are distance summaries assigned to the truck or driver? We have devices that move from driver to driver. If you move from one driver to another, does it retain the historical information under that truck? Or does everything just move with the driver? Now all that historical information is assigned to the new truck. Very important to be able to, to know these things ahead of time. Be prepared. Other tax savings. Some things that are derivatives of the, the fuel tax. Reefer fuel refunds for refrigerated carriers. You buy your tax paid fuel, clear diesel, and these, this fuel goes into separate tanks used to refrigerate trailers. PTO, power takeoff refunds. It's a device that transfers mechanical power from the engine to another piece of equipment on the, on the uh, vehicle. Fuel, the fuel used in this is refundable. APUs, auxiliary power units, uh, used for climate control in the cabs of the trucks. And DPF, diesel particulate filter refunds. Uh, it's a filter for the uh, emission standard and the fuel uh, and the fuel used in com the combustion process to clean the filter. Some things to know about refunds. Refunds on clear diesel only. So dyed diesel, there are no refunds, no tax paid. You only get a refund on tax paid. 
you want to know your state rules and regulations. Some states offer full refund, others you have to pay a sales and use tax, which, is, which will reduce the amount of your refund. Not all states offer reefer refunds. I know most of you are from Texas, so if this applies to you, please don't ask. <laughs> they do not, unfortunately. And it all depends on where you buy the fuel, um, where the fuel is purchased. With IFTA, it's a redistribution. This is a refund. It all depends on where you buy the fuel. Uh, for instance, you buy all your fuel in Georgia, your only, your only uh, refund available is with Georgia. You don't have to do any redistribution or anything like that. PTO, beware. Uh, this is based upon case study and it's constantly changing. So you wanna be abreast of what is in your state, what is applicable when it comes to that, that refund. APUs, again, clear diesel only. Um, you are required to take regular meter readings. So if you have something um, electronic in nature, automated in nature, it helps. Uh, some do it manually as well, but it could be very time consuming if you're doing it manually. And you have no refunds or no refunds are available for battery operated units. And you have your diesel, per diesel particulate refund. Uh, this is becoming increasingly difficult to gather data for these refunds as states are increasingly challenging these refunds. Okay. Our next topic for the day, for this session, licensing, permitting, and registrations. Required under FMCSA, US DOT, and some DOT intrastate authorities. I've had some conversations today about um, Texas. You have to maintain your own Texas DOT in addition to US DOT, okay? Registrations allow one to transport freight as a motor carrier. It's a unique identifier for motor carriers. It's an account number. With these account numbers, you're able to track things such as violations, accidents, CFAs. And startup and renewal fees apply to these. So also obviously be, be aware of those. Steps to establishing your operating authority. You wanna register with the appropriate state or county if you intend to, to base in. Obtain an employer identification number. You wanna register with the US Department of Transportation, US DOT. You wanna apply for a motor carrier number with the FMCSA. You wanna file a BOC3, which is a process agent, if you're familiar with that. You wanna obtain insurance. Set up your international registration plan for interstate travel. This is your portion plating. If you travel in more than one jurisdiction, rather than have you know, 48 license plates on your truck, you'll have just one, and that plate will allow you to travel in all those jurisdictions in which you're, in which you're apportioned to. You have the UCR, the Unified Carrier Registration, and then any special permits that you may need. Hazmat, overweight, oversize, uh, New, New York, New Mexico, your weight distance tax permits. This is what the structure looks like for an interstate carrier. You have your interstate carrier, you have your US DOT and motor carrier number, BOC3 and your UCR. IFTA, this gets you signed up for your fuel tax so you can start filing your fuel tax with the base state. Otherwise, as an interstate carrier, you, you'd be required to do, uh, you'd be required to uh, purchase fuel permits every time you wanna go out of the other jurisdiction, which is time consuming and will, it could hold you up. IRP, which is your apportion plating. Check to make sure you see you, that you uh, have the proper interstate authority if you need it, if it's required. And then special permits, such as trip and fuel, state mileage, and size and commodity based permits. Intrastate carrier, a little less, uh, little less to do here. You still have to register with USDOT. You have your intrastate authority. Still may, be, may require special permits such as trip and fuel, state mileage, size and commodity based as well. We have a uh, licensing and registration table here. This obviously is a uh, as uh, Stephen Howell mentioned earlier, this will be available to you all. So it's a very helpful table, which will start to help you conceptualize a, 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 a what you really need, where there could be any gaps, see if these criteria affect your operation, your unique, your unique environment. So we have our US DOT and MCF, your US DOT, MCF 150, motor carrier number, your BOC3, which is required with your motor carrier, your IRP registration, and as we discussed, uh, it's a reciprocity agreement providing for payment of apportioned uh, fees, US, Canada, interstate operations, your IFTA license, UCR registration, 
and a 2290 HVUT. It's your heavy highway vehicle use tax. It's levied by the IRS. Um, they're due, they were in uh, August, I believe. They're due at the end of August. And any vehicles that are over five, 55,000 pounds. Provided here for you, we have the, the two, I guess, strata, you could say, in terms of weights. And letting you know, giving you the opportunity to see, is this required for you based upon your operation, the specs on your vehicles, et cetera. We have permitting, okay, so there's a permitting reference table as well. Um, weight distance tax permits, if you travel in any one of the weight distance tax permit states, you can set up an account and then you can pay your weight distance taxes monthly or quarterly. Monthly with New York and Oregon, quarterly with New York, New Mexico, Kentucky, Oregon. The only two that allow quarter or that are that are mandatory quarterly are Kentucky and New Mexico. So it's a separate tax. It's levied upon the amount of miles distance you drive in those jurisdictions. It's separate from fuel tax. That's a common um, that's a common misconception is that I already paid Kentucky fuel tax. Why do I have to do this? And this is it's completely separate. It's based upon the the use the the consumption of miles in your in, your, in these jurisdictions. You have trip permits here. And these are heavily used by intra-state carriers that are traveling across state lines. They don't get their IRP. They go out of their jurisdiction a couple times a year, very infrequent. And then fuel permits. Again, intrastate carriers, very popular. They are traveling across state lines. They don't have IFTA. They never got registered with IFTA. They don't go across frequently enough to uh, be bothered with having to do an IFTA return. So they just buy fuel permits with the states that they're going through jurisdiction. All right, so as far as, as far as licensing and permitting goes, the name of the game is get in the game and stay in the game. Know what's required to start up. Anticipate and act upon requirements for your unique business environment. Know what to try to gauge what kind of special permits you're going to need beforehand. Some of these permits, you know, we need to acknowledge that some of them take a considerable amount of lead time for processing. U.S. DOT setups, obtaining insurance, even ob obtaining insurance. There's a considerable amount of lead time you need to be made aware of. Stay in the game. Avoid suspensions and fines. Stay ahead of your renewals. You could do this yourself. You could do it with the TPA, in-house management system. It's recommended you look at things at a 90, 60, 30 interval day, inter intervals. So in 90 days, you can see what's coming ahead of you. 60 days and 30, it's always in front of you. Our last area of uh, concentration today will be hours of service compliance. Okay. Hours of service rules, it focuses on driver behavior. All right. Why do we want to do hours? Why do we, what, what is it with hours of service? Why do we need to do it? We want to make our roads safer by reducing driver fatigue. What are we doing? DOT drivers are required to keep duty status records. In the very recent past, it was all paper. We've uh, migrated as a, as a requirement to do this with ELDs now. There's the ELD mandate that went into effect at end of 2017, and there's another mandate coming here at the, uh, the end of 2019 for the AO8 and then the next slide. Carriers are to ensure the completion and accuracy of their driver's daily logs, duty status logs. When do these need to be completed? They need to be completed timely, daily, while the driver is working. Daily audit and review is also highly recommended. And what's the DOT looking for? They're looking primarily for errors in form and manner and intentional falsifications. That's what they're looking for. Got it? Okay. So FMCSA hours of service risks. What are the risks? How are risks identified? Proactively, through audit and review, act now with at-risk drivers. You have violation letters, which you could use for corrective action. And they have congratulatory letters where you reward good behavior. But you want to be proactive. You're finding these things now before something bad happens. How are other risks? You know, how, what's the other alternative? Reactive. Unfortunately, an accident. You find out that there's some risk involved. You weren't aware of it. You got wind of it because there was an accident. A moving violation. You also, when there's a moving violation, we look at the logs and see what was this driver doing that day. Was there a falsification? And under DOT audit, DOT comes in, they audit, and they find risks. What are the risks? 
significant fine. You could be placed out of service. And obviously the, the, number, the name of the game here is safety. We're all here for safety. We want safe roads. We want, all of our, we want everyone to be safe. There's an increased safety risk for DOT carriers, their drivers, and the general public. And today, again, most, most carriers are subject to the ELD recording device, the mandate. Things to know about ELD, very important. ELD record, ELDs record engine data only. So what does that mean? You have an ELD, it's hooked up to the ECM, typically, plugged into the, the, uh, the engine, and it records the, the, the movement, it records the activity of the engine, what the truck is doing. It does not record automatically what the driver is doing. So that means the driver has to be coached, trained on how to properly use, properly use that device and add to the data. ELD logs show drive and shift violations only. Uh, they do not guarantee the driver is using it properly. So training, again, very important. Coaching, very important. Does not, uh, tip, most do not, uh, do not monitor for the short haul exemption. ELD logs have trouble historically with jurisdictional change for wide load and agricultural or produce loads. And under FMCSA compliance, the driver is responsible for making accurate notations and remarks on the e-log. Absence of these items on the logs themselves can result in fines, non-compliance. Another thing to, to consider with ELDs is ELD vendor websites. They don't centralize, historically, they don't, have cent they don't centralize paper and e-log data together. If you have an e-log that goes down, you're required to fill out a paper log. So now you have information in two different areas. When DOT comes in, it's much easier, much uh, it's a much nicer presentation when you're able to central have all of your data centralized in one area, and then they're able to view everything in one area, rather than have to piece things together. Some important dates here. ELD mandate from the past, December 18th, 2017. Uh, enforcement here on April 1st, 2018. And then what I mentioned here a couple uh, seconds ago, December 16th, 2019, the automatic onboard recording device and you had to switch over. So again, what is ELD compliance? We have FM FMCSA compliant, properly functioning ELD device, plus accurate and truthful driver notations and remarks for out of cab activity. They get out to fuel, they get out for a load securement check. That equals an FMCSA compliant log. Notations you should be looking for, looking at. Notations you should be coaching your drivers to make sure are being noted on their log, e-log, and putting into the system. Duty status changes, obviously. Border crossing, if they cross border between uh, the US and Canada. Roadside inspection, bill lading, timesheets. We have some that require the timesheets to be attached to the log. DVIRs, GPS pings. We have GPS positions, which your auditor could look at to determine the accuracy of the e-log. Fuel stops, if a, fuel, if a driver stops to fuel up, we wanna make sure the driver is properly noting that on the log. If they get in an accident, obviously, and the report, we wanna attach those to the e-log for that day. Toll stops and pre and post trip inspections. So best practice for hours of service. Know what rules apply. You have 100 mile radius rules, you have oil field, you have state rules, there's special rules and exceptions which apply to certain states. In order to find out more about these, you can contact your state DOT, federal, or PPA. Find the right training program. Hire trainers on, for on-site. Find appropriate and certified online interactive training programs. Seven hours of service management program. Very good practice, very wise to do so. Become an expert or outsource to a TPA for that management program. This will help you gain visibility into violations, how often these violations are occurring, and which drivers are causing the most frequent, severe infractions. And again, retain log data for six months. Stay proactive, set up disciplinary or incentive plans for drivers based upon compliant performance. Keep your documentation six months. Conduct ongoing training and re-education as needed. And stay aware of your CSA scores and how hours of service violations can affect them. I want to take a step back to retaining log data for six months. When you're using a, a GPS or an ELD vendor, you could be using them 
in theory, for two separate items. One of them is fuel tax. The other one is hours of service log auditing. When you do that, you want to make sure that they're not purging data that you need for fuel tax. After six months, your, your, your vendor should be purging your, your ELD data because it's no longer, by statute, you can, you can, you can purge that. You want to make sure that they're also not purging valuable information for GPS, which would tie into what you use to, to file your IFTA return. Very important to understand and know that. Tax compliance takeaways for commercial interstate carriers. Fuel tax compliance. Know which vehicles are qualified for fuel tax compliance. You have your burn versus buy strategies and cash flow strategies and considerations. Do you want to buy all your fuel or you want to purchase or you want to make purchases in high tax rate states now or low tax rate states now and defer some of that tax later to your IFTA return? In the end, again, you're still paying 100% of the tax due. You're either doing it all at the pump or spreading it out, but you will settle up in the IFTA process. You want to know your jurisdictional record keeping requirements. Texas has different requirements than Georgia. Georgia has different requirements than Ohio. They're all similar, but be aware of what they specifically require. You want to prepare for audits. Non-compliance can result in hefty tax assessments, penalty and interest. If you're using an ELD or a GPS distance summary, make sure that they will be, your, your vendor will be able to support you in an audit with the required data, and they retain that data for seven years. What you don't want to have happen is you go to your, your vendor and find out that they purge your data every six months. They purge everything. Also, see if there's any cost involved in that, what that looks like. For licensing and permitting, know what licensures, registrations, and permitting requirements are, are, are necessary. Stay ahead of your registration renewals. Idle assets don't make money. They have to allow for lead time, ample lead time. Avoid delays, get on the road quicker. Hours of service compliance, know the rule set that apply to your operations. Find the right training program. Employ an hours of service compliance management system. Stay proactive, stay on top of all of your drivers. Reward for good, and then be, uh, I hate to say discipline, but work with your at-risk drivers and coaching them to be a safer, more compliant driver. ELD data should be audited. Know the limitations of ELD data. So if you have any additional questions, I could take some right now, just general questions. You can also meet me at the networking, uh, the networking event later on. 